Welcome again to Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice, and today we have two Newfoundland writers, Joan Clark and Janet McNaughton. Joan is up first. Hi, Joan. Welcome to the show. Pleased to be here. You've written several novels and several books of stories and uh, books for young readers as well as adults. Take us through your evolution as a writer. How did you start out? Well, it started at a kitchen table in a rented house in Calgary where um, uh, I was a young mother and um, had never written a, a, any fiction at all, uh, ever. I was about nearly 30. I was about 29, 30, something like that around there. And I, um, for some reason, when my son was having a nap, I just picked up a notebook and I started uh, writing. I wrote a story and I filled that notebook in three more and that's how I got started. And that was a children's, that was a children's story and it was published to my great amazement. And uh, then I started writing short stories, um, adult short stories. And then I wrote two more children's books, and I wrote, I published a collection of adult short stories, and uh, uh, then I published an adult novel and uh, more children's uh, novels, and I just, both. I, I moved back and forth between the two, and it's not, there's nothing planned or calculated about this. It just depends on what uh, I'm interested in in writing at any given point in time. What were some of your great epiphanies along the way? Any epiphanies? Oh, I've had all kinds of epiphanies. I mean, you, that's one reason why I write, because it's filled with epiphanies. Uh, the first epiphany is what comes out of your head in terms of the discovery of uh, your ideas, what you know, what you think, and uh, what's in there. I mean, there's a lot inside our, uh, my head that, that if I didn't pick up a pen or, or sit down at a computer, I'd never know it was there. So that's the first uh, uh, sort of kind of epiphany. And then, of course, all of the different ways you can write a story. Uh, and I'm very experimental, actually. I try a lot of, to write my stories a lot of ways. I do a lot of that, actually, before I actually begin a book. It might go on for months. And that's filled with epiphanies, you know, in, in the sense, oh, yes, ah, yes, I can do it that way. Ah, yes, this, this works, yeah, to a point, and so on. Do you ever get discouraged? Yes, often. I think that's the, I think that's the, 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 the most dangerous um, um, pitfall, I guess I would say, of writing. Because you're lonely, you know, and you're by yourself. You're, you're alone. I wouldn't say... I'll correct that. I, I'm not, I don't really feel lonely when I am alone when I'm writing because I'm writing about people and, and I'm, wi I'm with them. To keep you That's helping. right. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's very easy to become discouraged because it's, it's a precarious business to be in and uh, there are a lot of ups and downs. Is it ever a struggle? Oh, yes. Yes. In fact, I haven't uh, had one of those. Uh, uh, moments for now a couple of years but for a while there I was going to quit every year you know this this was the year oh, I'm going to quit this year I'm not going to write anymore you know it's too hard it's too hard you know I mean this book Latitudes of Mel for example took five years uh, I actually I had a great time writing it it was a lot of fun so I, I didn't feel it when I was writing that book but some books uh, you feel that more more often than others probably. What sustains you then as a writer? Well, you just sort of, it's obsessive and you can't live without it, so you, you just, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's addicting and it, again, it's that sense of, of uh, discovery that is sustaining, you know, you, you know, and I feel the same way about reading. I mean, if I go too long without reading a book, a week but without reading a book, I mean, I get very anxious and, and you know, I'm irritable and I'm sort of restless and I pace around and it's that sort of thing with writing too. Newfoundland is very important in many of the things you write, including the new novel. How does the geography shape you as a writer? I've lived most of my life by the North Atlantic. And it's definitely imprinted my imagination. I, th I, th I, the more I write, the more I think that I, I have um, a geographical imagination, if I can put it that way. Um, and uh, this novel was inspired by an image of a, of a baby floating on an ice pan in, in the North Atlantic. And uh, you know, it, it, it all started there. And uh, that's certainly a geographical. Uh, image to begin the novel and then of course the title which sort of popped into my head one day when I was talking to a nice engineer, um, Latitudes of Mouth. Uh, I, well he, I'd asked him a question and, uh, and he answered it and I said oh yes that would be in the Latitudes of Mouth and he said Latitudes of Mouth I haven't heard uh, 
I haven't heard that before. Where did that come from? And I said, well, I probably read it, but in fact, I had made it up because my imagination was uh, of sort of floating over the landscape, and I was thinking of Newfoundland as the center of the world, and I could sort of see the lines of imaginary lines of, of uh, longitude and latitude, and I thought, oh, well, yes, that's the latitudes where the icebergs melt. You've woven the history of Newfoundland into your novels as well. Uh, what kind of an influence is that? Yes, well, um, Newfoundland, I've lived there 14 years, and it, it is, an island, it's is, is an island, it's contained, a great sense of containment, and that, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that there's a very strong sense of community there, despite its immense size. Um, and you quickly become aware of its history. Uh, a lot of the history in this novel I just, I just absorbed, you know, uh, through reading and because I'm interested in history and, and I've been listening and so on. And uh, the whole issue of confederation, I mean, it's very, very, people talk, still talk about it. I mean, it's 50, 51 years ago, people still talk about it. As if it was yesterday. Yes, so. that's right. So. Yeah, it's very fresh. Yeah. You mentioned that a baby is found on an ice pan there at the beginning of your novel. Take us to that place and describe the situation. What happens? Well, um, there are two fishermen at spring. Uh, they're out on the Grand Banks and spring fishing. And uh, uh, they are Francis St. Croix, who's from a little outport called the Druk, which is down on the southern shore of Newfoundland, not far from Cape Race, partway between uh, Trapassi and Cape Race. And uh, with him is Ernie Zwicker, who actually is from Lunenburg. And they are actually working out of a Lunenburg sc um, schooner, the Maria Claire. And uh, they're out in their dory, and they're bringing in their trawl lines when this thick fog comes down. And they lose, they lose sight of the, of the uh, schooner. And the schooner probably has looked for them and does, can't see them either. At any rate, they become lost. And by the way, this, this happened. This, was, this happened from time to time in spring fishing in the fog. So they start rowing back to Newfoundland, and of course that's been done too. And they come upon this uh, uh, baby. They see this ice pan, and there's a baby in a basket. Uh, and uh, they take the baby into the dory, and uh, they open up this rubber sheeting that's been wrapped around the basket to make it waterproof. And uh, they see this baby in there. It's a girl, a little baby girl. She's about a year and a half old. So they take her to, uh, to Newfoundland, and uh, Francis uh, is put ashore in the Druk with his baby. Uh, and uh, word is put out, you know, that the, who is this baby, you know, making inquiries, and nobody, nobody claims her. So she, she uh, grows up in the Druk, and is called Aurora. Her name is Aurora. And there's, there's some connection here with the sinking of the Titanic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bec and that is because, um, Although, strictly speaking, except for Newfoundland, uh, uh, the SOS being, uh, you know, received at Cape Race, it's strictly speaking, it's not a, a Newfoundland shipwreck. There are no new Newfoundlanders on it. Um, and there's strong connections here, of course, in, in Halifax, just as strong, maybe stronger. Yes. I don't know if there are any Nova Scotians on it. There were Canadians, however, mm -hmm. on the Titanic. But at any rate, that was uh, uh, just happenstance, because in 1991, and this was five years after Ballard actually found the Titanic, and he managed to keep its location secret, because he didn't want what has happened to happen, um, it came into St. John's. And uh, my husband and I knew somebody on board, somebody who lives here, as a matter of fact, in Dartmouth, Steve Lasko. And uh, they, the Keldish is the Russian Academy of Science ship. And um, in order to sort of keep itself in good repair, it has to hire itself out. And it had hired itself out in 1991 to the IMAX film people and the National Geographic and some Canadian scientists. And they went out to the site and they came back. And um, we were aboard the ship. And um, there were all these stills, these photo stills of the debris field. And at that time, those images were new. They've since become commonplace. But you know, the, the boots, you know, with nobody in them and the spectacles, and very poignant, immensely sad. They were on the walls. And we were sort of walking around and looking at them. And uh, when. Uh, when we left the ship, I went home and I started writing. And I wrote for several days, and I wrote and wrote and wrote about what I had seen. And that was when this image of a 
baby on the iceberg float wow. into my head. And the novel evolved from there? Yes, and actually the novel is, has a lot of shipwrecks in it, and there is a Titanic connection, but it's not about the, the, the Titanic. Some people believe that Aurora is a fairy child. This is an Irish Celtic idea, I believe. Maybe you could explain that. Well, a fairy, uh, well, a, a changeling, yes. Right. Well, um, uh, there again, this is uh, something I absorbed through uh, osmosis because my <laughs> Barbara Rietti, who uh, uh, has done a lot of uh, research, she was taking her PhD at Memorial in the folklore department. And uh, uh, my daughter used to babysit her her son, and so I had met her, and I knew that she had done this research on fairies in Newfoundland. She'd conducted a lot of interviews, and I went to her PhD a thesis defense, as a matter of fact, just because I was very interested in, in the subject, and then subsequently bought her book, Strange Terrain. And uh, there, the fairy belief in Newfoundland is different from the Irish fairy belief. Uh, there's the changeling, that is to say, uh, if you have a sick baby, uh, uh, it, uh, the, it's really a fairy baby because uh, your, the fairies came and took your healthy baby and put their sick baby in the place. And the other uh, recurrent uh, b uh, belief that c came out in these interviews that Barbara undertook uh, was a disorientation, you know, going out into the barrens or, or the wildness uh, of uh, wild tracks of Newfoundland and becoming lost and you come back and you don't know where you've been and there seems to be this sense of lost time that you can't explain. So um, I was very interested in exploring those in fiction. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I was in Iceland last month and uh, I was on a, uh, we were on a bus tour after this conference and up in uh, um, Saga country and uh, we passed what they call the Elves Rock and it was about 40 feet high and covered with grass and moss and so on. And um, the professor who was sort of guiding this tour said, oh, well, the elves, that's the hidden people live inside. And uh, two years pr prior to this, they had um, the road uh, crew was working there, trying. To, they were planning to move the road closer to the rock. And they had so many problems. The equipment broke down and people got sick and there were accidents that they actually changed the road. They didn't build it where they planned to, and that's only two years ago. So, but I do think that the fairy belief is a function of um, isolation, extreme isolation, and I think it probably, you know, because we're all connected so much now by, uh, you know, the internet and so on, is probably waning. Joan, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Enjoyed talking to you. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with uh, another Newfoundland writer, Janet McNaughton, right after this. Welcome back to Off the Page. My second guest today is Janet McNaughton. She's the award-winning author of many books for young people, and the new book is called The Secret Under My Skin. Now, The Secret Under My Skin is set in the 24th century. How has the world changed? Well, um, when I was starting to write this book, I was motivated by anger in a way that I haven't been with my other books at all. So I thought, okay, what if we just stay on the path we are now? We don't do anything about the environment. We don't do anything about global warming or the hole in the ozone layer. We let the social safety net fall to pieces. What kind of world are we going to be living in in a couple of hundred years? And that's the world that I've created. It's not a pretty place. It's not a pretty place. No, I, you know, I feel like the ghost of Christmas yet to come. It's not the world we must have, but it's the world we might have if we're not careful. And so my main character is, um, she doesn't know her own age, she doesn't know her own name at the beginning of the book, and she lives in what they call a model social welfare project, which is a work camp in what is now Grossmoor National Park. It's her job to mine a 20th century landfill for recyclable plastic and glass and paper at the very beginning. Now she's plucked out of that situation quite rapidly within a few pages of the beginning of the book. She's chosen to help a young woman who's a bioindicator, and it's her role to react to the environment. And Blake, my main character, what she discovers immediately is that everything that she has been taught about the way the world is is government propaganda. 
the government that seems so all-powerful when she was in the work camp is actually quite corrupt and crumbling and, and does actually, um, is defeated in the course of the novel in the way that the government of Yugoslavia was just defeated quite recently. So um, her life changes a great deal. She also grows a lot as a person. She develops a sense of her own self-worth. She finds people who value her as a human being for the first time. This novel is very different from books that you've written before. How do you make that leap into the future? Well, I've always loved science fiction. When I was in high school, uh, part of the curriculum, we would read a science fiction book every year. I think, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, that might have been a bit unusual. Um, and the kind of imagination that you need to recreate the past is not all that different from the kind of imagination you need to recreate the future or to create the future. The only difference is that uh, you can't go to the newspapers and magazines because they haven't been written yet. So I rely very heavily on newspapers and magazines when I'm doing my historical research. I didn't have that when I was doing this. Is this a protest novel of sorts? It's, I think, I like to think of it more as a wake up call um, because I, I get very frustrated by the fact that nobody seems to be paying attention to the future. We seem to live as if, you know, we can use up everything and it doesn't matter what comes after us, but these are our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren that we're thinking about and I think we should be being more responsible, even looking at the way every time there's a treaty to limit greenhouse gases, what goes on is people try to make as few concessions as possible. You know, we're, we're going to set these targets, these targets have to come down, then we're not going to meet them. And, and I find that very frustrating because the global warming train has left the station now. You know, when I was writing, when I was starting to write this book, global warming was still something people were debating. Was it really happening or not? Yeah, the oceans are rising, the climate is changing. And it, when, I, it, when I was starting to research this book, I read a book about global warming in the University Library at Memorial, and it said it had been written in the early 80s. It said by the end of the century, if greenhouse gas emissions continue, the world's temperature will have risen one degree Celsius. There will be more forest fires, there will be more floods, there will be more violent storms, and everything they were talking about had already happened. That was when Indonesia was on fire, and I thought, this is the future, we're already living in it. I think we have to really seriously think about what we're doing and, you know, in terms of calamity, the tornadoes and the floods and the ice storms that have increased and even if you talk to insurance companies, they'll tell you that they're paying out a lot more money for this sort of thing than they used to. Calamity is already sort of upon us. Montana was on fire most of the summer. You're very concerned about how we place value on an individual in society. Could you explain? Well, in my future, uh, everyone is given a, a use rating. It's called UR, and the kids in the work camp say you are what you are, and they don't have a very high use rating, at one or two. At the top is 10, and if you fall below one, they retire you, which means that your life is over. So I, I think that is my expression of anger about what we're doing with things like health care and the way that we're not taking care of the um, most vulnerable people in our society in the way that we used to. So uh, I just wanted to express that and I wanted it to be something that kids would think about. Is anger a, a useful tool to a writer? <laughs> well, you know, when you're writing for kids, I, I had to be very, very careful with this book to make sure that it wasn't cynical and that it was a book that, that in spite of all the bleakness of the society that I created, to make sure that there was a lot of hope there. Um, I think anger is something for, that really needs to be reined in. I, and it might have been my primary motivation in writing this book, but it couldn't be the main emotion that came across to the reader. Um, so my main character is very spunky. She's very resilient in the way that children can be. Children can be so much more resilient than adults because to them, life is all about changes. And um, it's a process of her, her life. She's not an angry person at all. She has longings and what she longs for most, I think, is, is to know that she's a person of value and that someone loves her. And she does manage to achieve that in the, in the process of the book. So I, I hope what will come across to the reader is not my anger, but my character's resilience and her quest for meaning, you know, um, for a sense of self-worth and for a place in the world, which she does achieve. Your future has gated cities. We already have a version of that, right? We do. And, and I thought, well, 
It's disturbing to think that people would closet themselves away like that and less, let the rest of the world go to hell. Um, and I, I wanted to express that. So the people who live inside the gated communities have access to technology. Their lives are very comfortable. The people who live outside the gated communities, their lives are extremely difficult. And in a lot of ways, what I, the things that I'm writing about are things that you could already find some places in the world. So the kind of city I had in mind was the kind of city that you would find in South America, where there are death squads trying to deal with these pesky homeless children. And some people have lives of, of complete affluence. How important is youthful rebellion in your stories? Um, in others, it hasn't been particularly important at all. In To Dance at the Palais Royale, the whole point was that the girl had no opportunity to rebel. She has to go, come to Canada to earn money so the rest of her family can come. In this story, it's not so much the youth who are rebelling as the entire society. And I think what I was trying to express there, because I am married to someone who teaches political science, and that does inform my writing, is that people can take direct action to change their circumstances. And you cannot oppress people forever. You can create an oppressive society, but eventually that's going to crumble. Because if people want freedom and they want democracy, eventually they will have it. So I, I think, you know, and we see that around the world. We've saw it in the Philippines and, and just what's happened in Yugoslavia. I think it's very important when, when young people start to look at political situations, it's very easy for them to believe that the way things are are the way they must be, and I as an individual can do nothing to change it. And what I wanted them to realize, I think, is that all change comes about because of the actions of people. You studied folklore, I think, in graduate school. Uh, does that in any way affect the kind of writing that you do? Oh, well, in this book, it figures quite directly, because uh, I had to create, I had to imagine a world in which there had been a complete breakdown in society, and then people would reconstruct their society. And we're past that in my book, but what would we have? So we have um, an organization of weavers' guilds, which are across North America. And they keep democracy alive by the organization of their, um, their, or their crafts groups. And um, they have certain rituals. They, when you become an accomplished weaver, you take a headscarf so everyone knows that you are an accomplished weaver. That very much, those kinds of things came right out of my folklore. They have uh, rituals that are no longer really necessary I have a girl who's a bioindicator. It isn't really necessary to have a bioindicator anymore, but people aren't ready to give up the security that that role provides well, them. The, the bioindicator is a person whose job it is to react to the toxins in the environment and tell people when it's dangerous. And in the course of the novel, Blake realizes that it probably never was a very useful way of dealing with the toxins in the environment, but it gave people a sense of security. And traditions that have been outlived will often continue, and I know that. She gets very annoyed at times. She said, at one point, she says, why do people have all these stupid beliefs? And one of the adults says to her, people don't stop believing in things just because they can. It becomes important to their way of thinking. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with Janet McNaughton right after this. My guest today, my second guest, has been Janet McNaughton. We've been talking about her book, The Secret Under My Skin. Uh, Janet, what do we learn about ourselves by studying folk traditions, stories, remedies, songs, all those sort of things? I think one of the things we learn is that people are fundamentally the same no matter where they are. That the, you know, the way in which they configure their culture is different, but the kinds of things that they need from their culture is always the same. Um, to me, that's a very useful thing, and it's something I try to uh, address in my book. Thanks for joining us here on the show today. And thanks for watching Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice. I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.